Hello, good morning everyone and welcome to our lecture for today. And this is your professor, Dr. Herbert B. Rosana. And I will be giving to you the introductory lecture about the globalization of world politics. And we will be talking about the globalization of um, governance. So welcome everybody and I hope that uh, all of you are comfortably seated in your in your places of study uh, whether you are using your cell phone your laptop or ipad or whatever platform or device that you're using i hope that uh, you are able to get through through this uh, um, lecture and of course uh, we expect that uh, as the reporters will begin to present their topics later on in our um, in the course of our um, study that we will gain a more clearer and a more uh, concise uh, uh, idea about the globalization of world politics. And I understand that we just finished and concluded um, the uh, uh, globalization of economic relations. And uh, I hope that this will help solidify our understanding of globalization as a multifaceted and multi uh, dimensional phenomenon in our contemporary world. To uh, facilitate the understanding or the delivery of our lecture for today, uh, please allow me to present to you the outline of the topic. And the topic are aligned um, to provide a logical arrangement to our understanding of international relations. So, uh, first in line, we are going to uh, define first what is the meaning of international relations because it's important that uh, we understand the meaning of the term and what it is uh, because we understand that international relations is another field in uh, political science. It is a specialized field in political science that deals with the phenomenon and intricacies of relations among nation states and other actors in the international arena then the second uh, topic will be um, the different theories of international relations the different ways by which uh, people by which uh, scholars politicians look at the uh, phenomenon of, of international relations so we will be looking at the different vantage uh, different lenses of how they understood international relations and this will help us uh, in our study and to further our understanding of this phenomenon then uh, third is we will talk also about uh, theories of world order uh, this is also very important because we need to know how power is distributed how power is distributed in the internet in the in the world in the globe and how this is facilitated by different actors and different institutions. Then, um, we will also discuss the origin of the nation-state system. So, the world that we live in today is made up of nation-state and uh, the concept of nation-state is not really very old. It's just uh, more recent, especially during the emergence of modern times when state uh, when political uh, uh, organizations began to identify themselves as um, nation state yeah. and so it came from uh, actually we can trace this idea from uh, the Treaty of Westphalia and also from the um, theory of uh, Hugo, Hugo Grotius who was the father of international relations and when he articulated the concept of national sovereignty so we will also be dealing with the different key terms in order for us to be able to understand um, the international relations as, as we say it uh, there should also be a um, the key we need to, we need the key in order to be able to open the doors to our uh, to our understanding because you know um, every discipline every field of study has its own lingo it uses a particular or peculiar language in order to convey its message so we need to understand 
and to be familiar with this lingo so that we'll be able to navigate in our readings, in our discussions, and in our understanding of uh, the field. So finally, in our discussion, we will be talking about the uh, global integration in governance. So we will ask the question whether uh, global integration diminishes the role of state as the highest form of political organization. This is quite a mm, quite a uh, debatable issue, and there are many issues arising from it. So let's go now to um, the topic of international relations. In simplest and ordinary parlance, international res relations are uh, the interaction among sovereign states. And these are um, kind of interaction that are facilitated in uh, several ways, but primarily through di diplomacy. Now, in a broader sense, if we would like to understand the meaning of IR, the study of IR, in addition to multilateral relations, concerns all activities among states, such as war, diplomacy, trade, and foreign policy, as well as relations with, among, with and among other international actors, uh, non-state actors like intergovernmental organizations or IGOs, and international non-government organizations or INGOs, international legal bodies, and multinational corporations or MNCs. There are several schools of thought within IR of which uh, the most prominent are uh, realism, liberalism, constructivism, and realism. Of course, we will not venture into explaining the other uh, theories because there are also other smaller and lesser variant theories but in case you encounter them in your readings you can just uh, google them so that it will enrich your understanding of these different theories as I have said earlier that the main tool in uh, diplomacy or in the conduct of relations among states is uh, diplomacy and usually this is transacted through uh, the services of ambassadors and other forms or other lesser officers in the diplomatic uh, diplomatic service and diplomacy is uh, uh, one of the oldest form of relations among uh, among states and in fact there are even unwritten uh, rules or traditions that are observed as a form of a law uh, among states then you also have trade that's why you we hear about the apec uh we have here about the g g10 g20 then we also have the BRICS. these are imp, uh, these are examples of multilateral multilateral organizations that um, facilitates the improvement of trade and you also have foreign policy this is uh, foreign policy these are uh, some sort of a guide that are formulated by different states and uh, we should also understand that uh, that nation states are motivated by um, they are motivated by their actions are motivated by um, uh, national interests so if you are interested to know the meaning of national interest you can look it up also again in the google or in the encyclopedia britannica or whatever encyclopedia it is and I think it will help you understand the meaning of national interest. And simply put it, national interest is the search for power and security. And this is the main motivation for all states as they relate with one another. And of course, in this kind of equation, in this kind of relationship, we could not also uh, discount the, the role of um, other non-state actors like intergovernmental organizations examples like the ILO WHO um, etc then there is also the international non-governmental organizations like uh, the Greenpeace um, Human Rights Watch and other sem similar things that uh, there are and also the multinational corporations these are also international actors that interact with um, the nation states and 
these things cannot be relegated because sometimes uh, um, their operations intersect with with concepts of sovereignty. So, uh, so when you relate to uh, this, also also we also have the international legal bodies like the ICC. Um, there are also treaties that are connected to these international legal bodies, like for example the Rome Statute. Um, you also have the UNCLOS and the other forms of treaties wherein there are uh, legal bodies that govern uh, the actions of countries that have um, acceded to the treaty. Also another example will, would be the uh, NPT, uh, the Non-Proliferation uh, non Treaty when it comes to uh, the use of nuclear weapons because uh, uh, these things cannot be avoided because some problems can no longer be resolved by the state but rather it has to be resolved through uh, multilateral cooperations among states. Previously, in the earlier part of the history, it was conceived that the state is the ultimate power, um, the ultimate authority because it is the only one that could guarantee the security, the well-being, and safety of its citizens. But because, that, because of uh, um, progressive integration, because of globalization, there are things, uh, there are problems in the world community that uh, that cannot be dealt with by just one state. That it needs a lot of cooperation, especially in the field of climate change, um, international crime, and also um, economic stability. Because of economic integration, it also becomes uh, behooves us that economic security will be the concern of not only one country but but the rest because what happens in one country can also have its effect on another the, uh, that's why uh, we also have this uh, international legal bodies that deals with with crimes against humanities uh, things like um, things are related to uh, related to that and of course this is also in infringes on the the concept of sovereignty because once a state uh, begin to interact and submit itself to this treaty they subject themselves to the authority outside of themselves. So this is another form of debate in international um, relations and in political science. And of course, if you are interested, you can further um, make your readings on this and um, we could understand the, uh, the debate regarding the, the role of the state in globalization. So let, let's come now to the different theories of international relations. So what are theories? So kailangan po maintindihan natin ang kahulugan nitong mga theories. So magtatagalog muna ako ng sandali para medyo maintindihan. So uh, ang mga theories ay napakahalagang maintindihan sapagkat ang itong mga theories nito ay para silang mga salamin. Like for example, if you could imagine a person wearing different kinds of lenses, different colors. So it's time that you will wear a particular lens with a particular color. You will see a different picture than the other lenses. Or itong mga theories nito, we could also explain this in a way that uh, you are standing on a mountain below the uh, below the valley. You are looking at the valley. And perhaps you could imagine that in that valley there are different types of mountains, there are different types of hill. That if you went to the other hill, if you climb the other mountain, um, you will have a different vantage point of view of the the valley. So if you are uh, situated in a particular mountain or hill, you will perceive the valley according to that um, according to your vantage point. So. Theories, on the other hand, are mental maps. They are mental maps. They are a mental explanation of a particular phenomenon or a particular event. And sometimes uh, when you are confined to one theory, you tend to see things only according to the, to the viewpoint of that theory. But since we are scholars and we are studying, we're students, uh, it's important that we look at the different vantage point and try to compare and create a dialogue among all of this and to create um, some sort of um, 
uh, synergy so that we'll be able to see from the different vantage point and weigh in um, which is better, which is uh, more advantageous. And also at the same time, this will also help us understand why some nation states or why some international organizations or, or group of people in the international community behave in a particular way. So it will help us interpret, understand um, the wars, the trade wars, or um, the way countries behave with each other, etc., etc. So let us, uh, let us begin now our examination. And let us uh, first take a look at the first theory, realism. And um, realism is a very popular theory. And um, this is a theory that posits that the states are the primary actors in international system. And they act according to their own self-interests, seeking power and security. And realists often emphasize that the role of power politics, the struggle for power, and the balance of power in shaping international relations. Because for the realist, the world is an anarchic world. So it is, it is a world of anarchy. And um, the nation states and individuals, uh, individual organizations, they are working within a, a kaleidoscope of um, nation states exercising sovereign powers in their own particular territory and their relationship is characterized by a struggle for power a, a search for balance because you know when there is a balance of power in the international field um, peace and security is maintained or it is one way of preventing um, warfare or violence or to prevent nation states from engaging in violent behavior but uh, sometimes when you look at the world, the world order in such a way, because there are many ways of looking at the world, uh, the world order. Uh, for, first, you have the unipolar world, you have the uh, bipolar world, and you also have the multipolar world. So when, when we say that there is a unipolar world, meaning to say there is one, there is only one superpower in the world, and sometimes the responsibility of policing the world rests upon this um, entity. This is the uh, okay. So, ano ang the best example ng isang unipolar world, di ba? Nang, nang matapos ang Cold War ng 1991, ang mundo natin slid back into a unipolar world. So, kumbaga, ang na, natirang superpower noon ay ang United States of America. That's why, uh, because of the decline of this, uh, the Soviet, the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the decline of Russia as a world power um, na atang sa US yung, yung power na yun that's why the US becomes more dominant and you will wonder why the US is involved in almost all types of conflict and difficulties around the world because that is their role as a, a superpower they have to maintain their standing in the world they have to advance and protect their own interests so they have to be involved in many ways because whatever happens in any part of the world will have an impact on their um, economy on their the way they uh, conduct their um, their affairs in the world so but after several decades maybe two decades later we see that our world become is becoming now a multipolar world meaning to say there are many centers of power there are many countries uh, nation states that are becoming powerful like for example China um, uh, India for example and um, Russia for example these are beginning to develop uh, uh, as centers of power there are also nation states that are becoming um, say uh, regional power centers like for example in the Middle East you have Turkey you have Iran and you have Saudi Arabia competing for influence and uh, power. So in um, the, the southern part of America, you also have Brazil and um, many other more examples that um, I could give. But you know, when we live in a multipolar world, the more that the world would be at the brink of conflict because conflict happens um, usually when there are uh, different centers of competing power. That's why uh, people in the, the international relations arena 
uh, they try to work for a bipolar world because uh, the world is a little bit more peaceful when there is a balance of powers because uh, because uh, conflict is prevented in that way okay now the next um, uh, theory is liberalism so liberalism in international relations emphasizes the importance of institutions cooperations and interdependence among states liberals believe that cooperation and diplomacy can lead to mutual gains and the resolution of conflict they also stress the significance of democracy human rights and the free trade in promoting peace and security this kind of view of international relations or this theory is prevalent and popular especially in the united nations so actually this is um, the guiding philosophy of the united nations belief in diplomacy um, the belief in the promotion of democracy human rights will provide a better world and in fact there are even uh, there are even uh, uh, political scientists who believe that way that by promoting democracy promoting human rights the world will become better and there is one particular book that uh, I would like you to I would like to recommend for you to read um, that's the book of Francis Pokoyama the title of the book is the end of history um, in that kind of book um, he highlighted the importance of Western democracy um, na sabi niya na pag ang Western democracy daw ay uh, naglaganap na eventually the world will become more peaceful I don't know if he is correct uh, but probably by looking at um, the events in international relations by looking at the uh, the different phenomenon we'll be able to um, understand we'll be able to judge the work of these people uh, there's also another kind of book written by um, what's the kind of that book I always forget the the author of that book um, it's the it, it's entitled uh, um, the clash of civilization the class of civil by by Huntington uh, but that kind of book is not about liberalism but it is more akin to um, realism you can also try to read that um, try to look for that for that book and they are I, I think they are you don't have to go to the to um, you don't have to go to the bookstore to buy these books but uh, uh, they are available online so if you have plenty of time to spare uh, try to read this book because this, this will help you understand um, what I'm talking about then we also have constructivism so probably um, we are familiar with constructivism constructivism is a theory that focuses on the role of ideas norms and identities in shaping international relations it suggests that actors perception and belief about the world as well as the social construction they adhere to influence their behavior and interactions constructivists argue that international relations are not solely determined by material factors but also by uh, the social contracts that's why social constructivists often deconstruct theories sometimes they deconstruct narratives or they analyze narratives they analyze uh, theories in order to be able to understand and predict the behavior of um, political persons the, beh the behavior of nation states etc etc that's why um, itong mga like for example itong mga movements sa mundo natin na uh, have you heard especially um, commonly said by politicians yung sabi nila na rules based um, rules-based um, regime they say it in the in international relations these are kind these are the kind of ideas emanating from uh, constructivism um, they're saying that that probably we could improve the relationship among nation states if we could uh, persuade them to follow certain rules to follow certain norms yan kasi nga uh, although may tinatawag tayong international law like itong mga Geneva Conventions, mga human rights law, mga treaties, these are considered international law. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, these are considered international law. Uh, but you know, international law is uh, very peculiar uh, because you know, pag ang, ang batas kasi, bago mo matawag na ang isang bagay ay isang batas, may mga karakteristik siyan. 
ang the very first is that a law must be promulgated. So, kailangan ipasa siya. Kailangan ipahayag siya. It must be promulgated. Then, second, that law must be enforced. And third, any infraction or failure to comply with the requirements of the law that there should be some sort of penalty. And there must be somebody who should give penalty. But the problem with international law is that there is no world government to implement the law. There is no world government to um, to to inflict to inflict penalty on those who do not want to follow. And sometimes that's why sabi nila parang may enraw, parang may uh, double standards. That because in some cases some powerful countries are a- able to escape responsibilities and accountability under international law, while others are sanctions and punished because. Uh, the implementation of international law will depend upon the goodwill and respect of the parties who acceded to the treaty. And sometimes, um, a penalty is also imposed by, or the sanctions are imposed by powerful countries. Like, for example, when the United States imposed sanctions on Iran, for example. That's an example of a powerful country imposing some kind of punishments or some kind of sanctions on another country who does not wish to follow uh, the rules-based actions that were agreed upon in international law. Then, um, ito, uh, we also have this neoconservativism. So, neoconservativism is a perspective in international relations that emphasizes the promotion of democracy, human rights, and, and American power abroad. Neoconservatives advoc- advocate for an assertive foreign policy approach including military intervention and if necessary to spread democratic values and combat threats to international um, security and this kind is uh, this kind of um, uh, point of view is popular actually in america and some can, some american administrations have been pursuing their foreign policy with the, with the guidance of uh, neoconservatism so, I have given you the four traditional theories of international relations and I hope that this will guide us in understanding our future interaction with uh, the globalization of world politics. So, here are some of the other key terms in international relations that um, perhaps you will encounter this as we go along the way. Okay, so the first is international organizations. So what are international organizations? These are institutions composed of member states that work together to address common challenges and promote cooperation in various areas such as peacekeeping, economic development, and environmental protection. Examples of this include um, the United Nations, the World Bank, and International Monetary Fund. So these are examples of international organizations and um, international organizations can be global, um, it can also be regional. So when we say regional, it, um, it is concentrated on a specific uh, geographical location in, in the world, like for example, um, ASEAN, uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, that is an example of a regional organization. Then you also have like for example the african union so the african union is an example of a regional organization you also have the eu or european union then you also have the north atlantic uh, treaty organizations so these are examples of international organizations and organizations can also be global like for example the united nations the United Nations organization is a global organization. Then we go to globalization. Of course, we have been discussing um, globalization before, especially at the beginning of our course. We already differentiated uh, the meaning of globalization from other terms. So in other words, in simply speaking, globalization refers to the increased interaction among people among nations and then third is uh, we have the balance of power i've already spoken also in the previous slide i talk about 
um, the meaning of the balance of power. So the balance of power is a concept in international relations um, that suggests that stability in min is maintained when power is distributed among states in a way that prevents any single state or group of states from um, dominating the others. So states may form alliances or emerge in power balancing behavior to maintain or shift the balance of power in their fav favor. So this is um, the work of diplomacy. So when you look at the current events and try to look into how states relate with each other, how they work in international arena, you will realize that some of them are uh, working hard to maintain this uh, balance of power in order to maintain the stability in the world and to prevent a war or conflict or violent conflict that, that will adversely affect the well-being of nations. Um, earlier, I spoke about the meaning of world order. So, in relation to the different theories of IR, we also need to have a grasp or an understanding of the meaning of world order. So, when we say world order, this is uh, the overall structure and arrangement of power, norms and rules and institutions that govern interactions among states and other actors in the international system. And it encompasses the principles, mechanism, and dynamics that shape the behavior of states and contribute to the maintenance of stability, peace, and cooperation at the global level. So that's why uh, you always ha uh, you always see, for example, um, uh, the world is perceived as either uh, unipolar, bipolar, and multipolar. So currently, the world that we live in is in a multipolar world because there are many uh, centers of power. Although the United States remain as one of the most powerful countries in the world, but there are also other emerging states that are uh, showing themselves militarily in the field of military, in the field of economics, in the field of science and technology, and some of them are emerging. That's why. Um, there are many different kinds of economic and political forums like, for example, the G10, G20, the G7, G10, G20, for example, like that, um, things like that. The purpose of that is to create a dialogue and to create a consensus in order how these powers can be distributed. And often you can hear them, um, you can hear them talk about, uh, uh, you can hear them talking about the... Uh, establishing a rules-based norms. So, halimbawa doon sa South China Sea, for example, madalas sinasabi ng Pilipinas, madalas sinasabi ng United States, at madalas sinasabi ng mga ASEAN countries na there should be a rules-based uh, kind of policy or agreement or understanding among the different claimants in the South China Sea in order to prevent conflict and in order to prevent violence in the future. So, yan ang mga examples ng multilateralism. Ang unipolar system is, that's the kind of um, worldview wherein there's only one dominant country. Like, for example, after the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991 and after the end of the Cold War, uh, we slid back into a world that is a unipolar world wherein it was only the United States in the international community who could, de who could demonstrate uh, uh, power. That's why uh, they were most likely involved in many conflicts around the world because, you know, when you are a superpower, your interests are also worldwide and whatever happens in any other parts of the world will have a definite impact on your standing, in your, um, in your wealth, and in your power. That's why they are always prepared to intervene or to be involved in uh, whatever conflict it is or problem around the world. And usually, um, the superpower um, is by obligation, um, even if it is not their choice, um, they have the obligation to police the world. But um, when we say bipolar, that is... Uh, when there are only two centers of power. So usually, some of the nation states, some of the client states, um, they tend to congregate uh, to hold alliances in either um, in either both power and 
and um, a balance is created and when there is a balance of power a balanced distribution of power uh, there is always um, equilibrium and it, they are able to maintain uh, peaceful coexistence in such manner so let us describe this uh, world order that we have discussed and let me show you some of the features of the world order uh, first and foremost is uh, the power distribution the distribution of power among states and other actors such as international organization determines the hierarchical structure of the international system this can range from unipolarity the dominance of one power um, they, they, this can also be multipolarity, the balance of power, and among several major powers, or even nonpolarity, diffusion of power among multiple actors. So, diniscuss ko na ito kanina. So, makikita natin na um, pag multipolarity, ibig sabihin, ang powers ay nakadistribute siya sa buong mundo. Minsan may mga... May mga countries na more powerful, less powerful, but they are still powerful. At isa sa mga surian ngayon, paano mo masasabi na ang isang bansa ay makapangyarihan? Um, you can say that uh, for sure is if you are a member of the uh, nuclear power club. So meaning to say you have nuclear weapons. Uh, that is also one way of them to to measure your your significance as a major as a major power. Then another is uh, you also have the norms and rule. World order is influenced by the norms and rules that govern state behavior and interactions. Um, these norms can include principles of sovereignty, non-interference, human rights and the prohibition of aggression, international law and treaties play a crucial role in codifying and enforcing these norms. That's why Kung familiar kayo sa word, have you heard this, uh, the Geneva Conventions? Actually, the Geneva Conventions is the rules of war. They become effective, they become um, enforceable during times of war, but not during times of peace, only during times of war. So, kung baga, ang tawag dito ay international humanitarian law. Parang ano nga siya, parang it's like a paradox, a uh, contradiction because... Why do you say it uh, humanitarian law when after all, war is inhuman because of its violence? But actually, the purpose of the um, Geneva Conventions or the uh, International Humanitarian Law is to humanize the conduct of war. Because we know that war and violence are uh, truly destructive and painful and traumatic. So to make it more at least um, you know to lessen the the pain to lessen the the sense of injustice um, humankind has developed this kind of rules where all nations who acceded to it are made accountable okay so that is uh, how i explain the norms and the rule then you also have institutions and governance so international institutions such as the united nations the World Trade Organization and regional organizations provide uh, frameworks for cooperation, dispute resolution, and collective decision-making among states. These institutions contribute to the management of global affairs and the promotion of common interests. So, in this world order, we can see uh, different kinds of uh, organizations like the United Nations, the World Trade Organizations, uh, they are responsible for facilitating the creation of rules-based engagement among the different nation states. So you can just imagine if there are no institutions like that, um, how are we going to operate in the world? So the world might be a more difficult uh, place to live. Okay. Although there are many things that we need to improve, and yet uh, these, things are, these things are provisional and provide some kind of uh, stepping stone towards a better uh, better future then you also have the um, security architecture so the security architecture of the world order encompasses mechanisms for maintaining peace and security such as alliances arms control agreements peacekeeping operations and diplomatic negotiations collective security arrangement aim to prevent and manage conflict while deterrence strategies seek to dissuade aggression through 
the threat of retaliation. So dito po mapasok yung mga tinatawag natin na mga sanctions. Halimbawa, yung mga countries na na nagte-threaten sa ibang countries na hindi nagko-conform sa international law, sometimes yung mga powerful countries ay binibigyan sila ng mga sanctions. And sometimes uh, country countries through the by means of diplomacy sometimes they might uh, uh, give some threats to other countries in order to um to um, persuade them to be able to to follow international norms so you have hard power soft power yung soft power has something to do with um, uh, persuasion yung hard power naman is with the use of uh, military threat or a threat of violence then also economic integration so economic in interdependence and globalization play a significant role in shaping world order by fostering trade investment and economic cooperation among states international financial institutions and trade agreements facilitate economic integration and regulate economic interaction at the global level so this is very common now and uh, you can see your economic integration like for example we have the apec whose purpose is to promote uh, the reduction of tariffs and trade and the opening of borders uh, we also have wto that governs the the trade uh, provides uh, provides uh, provides rules for trade and exchanges something like that and you can also see other nations like for example china has been promoting the brics um, agreement between india brazil china etc and also you also have uh, you also heard about the um, the belt and road initiative or something like silk road being created by china a metaphor using the the silk road of ancient time as a metaphor for these modern innovations of linking the economies of uh, many different countries in order to challenge the current order, especially the dominance of the US dollar. So these are the uh, features of world order. So it can be, it can be understood from uh, these five uh, variables. You have the power distribution, the norms and rule in institutions and governance, security architecture, economic integration. So, dumako tayo ngayon sa um, origin of the nation-state system. Uh, in the earlier slide, I have mentioned the word nation-state system, the word nation-state. Actually, itong konsepto ng nation-state ay nagsimula ito sa Treaty ng Westphalia at uh, subsequently doon sa mga theory ni uh, Hugo Grotius at saka ng iba pang mga scholars, mga early modern um, uh, later modern um, political scientist itong mga nation-state system bakit siya tinawag the nation-state? kasi usually yung yung state na yung state na nakikreate ay nakikreate din siya ng certain identity and loyalty among its citizens kaya kumbaga parang nagiging siyang yung state nagiging para siyang nation in a way because it is possible uh, kasi we have to distinguish a state and nation kasi sometimes these two these two terms are uh, used interchangeably some people uh, when talking about this uh, political entity sometimes they would say nation when they re what they mean is a state some people say state when they really mean nation so therefore um it is possibly po yun na ang isang state uh and ang ibig sabihin kong sabihin is, is it, it is possible na may isang bansa na mayroong dalawang state or several states example um, when you go to Korea for example there is only one Korean nation nationality Korean but there are two states you have North Korea and South Korea so the North Korea is called um, the People's Democratic Republic while South Korea is called the Republic of Korea so there are two states but it is made up only of one nation now it is also possible to have one state but that state is made up of different nations diba? like for example uh, china china is an example of a, a state where there's only where, where there are several nationalities within its territories 
So uh, the dominants are the Mandarin, you have the Cantonese, um, you have the uh, Tibetan, and etc. Others, other nationalities in China, but all of them identify themselves as Chinese because they belong to the People's Republic of China. They belong to that um, to that kind of state. That's why, in the modern parlance, when we say nation state, we are refer referring to a political organization made up of people whose allegiance is with the state. For example, tayo bilang mga Pilipino, whether Bisaya man tayo or taga Luzon o taga Mindanao, sinasabi natin na Pilipino tayo sapagkat we owe our allegiance to the Republic of the Philippines. And whatever we are, whether we are uh, Bisayan or Mindanawan or Luzonian, we always identify ourselves with our state, Republic of the Philippines, and we call ourselves Filipinos. That is what we mean by uh, the nation-state system. Kasi nga sa modernong panahon natin, nakita natin na yung state nakapag-create siya ng uh, sense of loyalty, sense of identity, na parang nagiging nation ano siya, parang nagiging singular yung kanyang, uh, kanyang nakikreate na identity para sa mga citizens. Okay. So now, uh, the origin of the nation-state system, of course, we have nagsimula ito because of the decline of feudalism. So the social and economic system characterized by the decentralized political authority and loyalty to the local lords began to decline in Europe around the late Middle Ages. And this decline was influenced by various factors including the growth of commerce and urbanization, um, the Black Death, and the challenges in agricultural practices. Kumbaga, na-overtake na yung dati, yung Europe noon is made up of different feudal centers. Uh, here and there, there are lords that uh, possess the land, or there are kingdoms made up of allegiances from different uh, feudal lords, for example. But because of the growth of the economy, because of the industrialization, there was also a change in the social and political uh, political system or political organization. Okay. So, next is uh, the rise of the centralized monarchies. So, pagkatapos ng feudalism, as feudalism waned, centralized monarchies began to emerge in Europe. Monarchs such as those in England, France, and Spain sought to consolidate power within their territories and often at the expense of feudal lords. So, they established bureaucratic system. Um, they raised taxes and built standing armies to assert control over uh, the realms that they are claiming. Then, uh, we also have the, the issue of nationalism. The rise of nationalism played a crucial role in the formation of the nation states. Nationalism is the ideology that emphasizes the identity unity and sovereignty of a particular nation or ethnic group. It often involves a um, shared language, culture, history, and territory in Europe. And nationalist movements emerged as people sought to unite under a common identity and assert the right to self-governance. So another factor that contributed to the rise of the nation-state system is uh, the Treaty of Westphalia in uh, 1648. So the Peace of Westphalia, which ended in the which ended the Thirty Years' War in Europe, is often cited as the um, seminal event in the development of the nation-state system. So the treaties reaffirm um, the principles of sovereignty and recognize the right of rulers to control religious affairs within their territories. This contributed to the establishment of a system of sovereign states which defined borders and mutual recognition. Okay. So ngayon, we also have the rise of colonialism and imperialism. So Europe's colonial expansion and imperialism also uh, played a significant role in shaping the nation state, state system. So European powers established colonies around the world often imposing their own political, econ economic, and cultural system on, on indigenous people. And this process helped the spread of the concept of the nation-state beyond Europe and contributed to the establishment of new states based on nationalist movements and anti-colonial struggles. 
So, these are the factors that contributed to the origin of the nation-state system. Then we also have, the last is uh, the Peace of Vienna in 1815. So the Congress of Vienna, which concluded the Napoleonic uh, Wars, further solidified the nation-state system in Europe. So the Congress sought to restore stability and balance of power on the continent by uh, redrawing movements leading to uh, subsequent revolutions and nationalist uprising throughout the 19th century. So kung susuriin natin itong mga nabanggit kong mga ano mga nabanggit kong mga factors that led to the nation state system ang lahat ng ito ay are these are all the progress in the history of politics in the history of of the nation states which led to the current nation state system that we see in the world order or that we see in the contemporary uh, world so here I'm showing you some pictures about the uh, Treaty of Westphalia. As I have told you, the Treaty of Westphalia is the kind of treaty sponsored by the Holy See and the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which brought about the, uh, the end of the 30 years war in Europe at the time, when the different countries of Europe were at war with each other, all the kingdoms and all the entities, they were fighting each other. Um, at na-realize ng mga leaders ng mga kingdoms, mga princes ng Europe, na-realize nila na it is not contributing to anything. It, it amounts to nothing. So there was a decline in the economy and uh, people were always fighting each other. So therefore, they decided that uh, they, would, they would come for a treaty in the city of Westphalia. And... Uh, most of the leaders signed it and this is actually the beginning of the peace and they began to uh, from this treaty they began to define their borders and they said that uh, sabi nila ang pinagmumulan daw ng kanilang mga away at gulo ay dahil sa ang pakikialam ng isang bansa sa isang bansa so therefore dito nila dinefine yung borders nila at dinefine nila yung sovereignty na mag-agree sila na hindi sila makikialam sa mga internal affairs ng bawat country. In order for them to be able to maintain the peace, they should learn to respect the borders and the, the, um, and the integrity of uh, the rulers of these uh, states. Kaya kung tatanungin tayo, ilang state ba meron? Uh, depende po yan kasi itong nation state ay nagsimula ito sa Europa. All of this started in Europe. And from the map that I'm showing you, these are the states uh, prior to World War I. Kasi every time na nagkakaroon ng digmaan, minsan nababago yung mga borders. So makikita mo how different these borders are to the kind of borders that uh, we know today. So these are the states after World War I. So nang matapos ang digmaan, ang unang digmaan, nagbago ang mga borders. So, these are the nation states in Europe. So, you have the Ottoman Empire, Austria-Hungary, um, Germany, then um, the other Central European states. At ito naman ang mga states after the Second World War. So, dumami na siyang bigla. Bakit dumami na? From Europe, mayroon ng mga states sa Africa, sa Asia. Mga, most of these are newly independent um, ito yung ano kasi nga because of uh, because of the western colonization after world war 2 and with the establishment of the united nations uh, they decided to decolonize kaya yung mga dating mga colonies ng mga foreign powers became independent kaya lahat sila nasa proseso ng pag pagtatayo ng kanilang uh, kanilang state so, kaya, kaya kadalasan sa mga African, sa mga Asian countries, nag struggle sila. Unlike sa Europe na matagal lang established yung mga states nila, napagdaanan na yung lahat ng proseso. So, yung mga countries sa Asia, sa South America, sa Asia, struggling pa rin sila. That's why may mga terms tayo ginagamit like, for example, failed state, uh, state capture, etc. Yan, ang failed state, ito yung mga states na they failed in their efforts to build their nation. Yan. Kaya nga nagkakaroon sila ng mga failure. Yan. 
they are no longer able to uh, uh, fulfill their international obligations with the uh, uh, international community. So finally, we come to the last question. Will global integration in governance diminish the role of the state as the highest form of political organization? The answer to this question is quite complex, but I decided to uh, give you a comprehensive um, answer. So global integration in governance has the potential to challenge the traditional role of the state as the highest form of political organization. But uh, whether it will diminish the role entirely remains uncertain and subject to debate. And several factors contribute to this dynamic. In fact, sabi nga ng iba, uh, sabi ng iba ay hihina ang role ng state kasi nga nagkakaroon na ng mga multilateral organizations and sometimes uh, yung mga individual states are forced to share their sovereignty within these ano, uh, organizations. Pero may isang uh, lado naman or parte ng, ano, ng debate na nagsasabi na may mga states na ginagamit nila ang mga multilateral organizations in order to strengthen their positions in the world and to make themselves more assertive and dominating other states. So, yan ang um, current debate ngayon na, na pinagsasaliksikan. Okay. So, here are some of the factors that I would like to discuss with you. Uh, the first one is uh, multilateralism and international institution. So the proliferation of international organizations and institutions such as the United Nations, the European Union, and the World Trade Organization has led to increased cooperation and decision-making at the global level. These institutions often require states to cede some degree of sovereignty in exchange for collective action on issues such as peacekeeping, trade and environmental protection as states collaborate more closely through multilateral frameworks, their autonomy and authority may be constrained in um, certain areas. Then we also have the transnational challenges. Globalization has given rise to uh, transitional challenges that transcend national borders such as climate change, uh, terrorism, uh, pandemics, and cybercrime. Addressing these challenges effectively often requires coordinated action among multiple states. And non-state actors in response, states may seek to pool resources, share information, and harmonize policies through international agreement and mechanism, potentially diluting their exclusive authority over certain policy domains. So, ibig sabihin, Ang ibig sabihin nito ay ang isa sa mga challenges ngayon sa nation states ay yung pinatawag natin ng mga transnational problems like for example itong climate change hindi lang ito mare-resolve ng isang country at hindi lang isang country ang maapektuhan nito uh, it this will affect every everyone lalong-lalo na also ang terrorism so kanya kailangan talagang may ano kailangan talagang may cooperation ang bawat isa in order for them to be able to solve this pati na rin itong pandemic there must be a united uh, uh, united um, effort in order to deal with this problem so hindi ito masosoro ng kahit sinong bansa that's why papasok dyan yung tinatawag natin na multilateralism then another is uh, supranational governance ang challenge ngayon ay how are we going to implement um, uh, international law how are we going to um, establish our rules-based world order yan, kung walang gobyerno that's why there are attempts to create such kind of a thing although although wala naman talagang world government wala namang regional government because that will be contrary to the idea of sovereignty of which um, nation states today are clinging to and hindi talaga siya pwede pero may mga attempt na to, to have this kind of quasi arrangement like for example you have the uh, European Court of Justice, you have the European Commission, and the European Union, Union is uh, more advanced in this area of cooperation, of integration. Okay, I don't know if in the future magkakaroon tayo ng world govern government or whatever, I don't know, but uh, 
there are even attempts to to have some semblance of it in order to bring about a world order then we have uh, sub-national actors and global cities so yung pag-emerge ng mga super cities uh, na nagiging center of financial centers of powers etc and globalization has empowered sub-national actors such as cities provinces and non-governmental organizations to engage directly in global governance and um, diplomacy. Yan. Then you also have the resilience of the nation state. So, pag tinignan natin itong mga factors na ito, like for example, multilateralism, transnational challenges, supranational governance, subnational actors, and global cities, makikita natin na the nation state is resilient sabi nila mawawala na ang nation state but still it is there is still a nation state so globalization has empowered subnational actors such as cities and provinces and non-governmental organizations to engage directly in gober- global governance and diplomacy cities in particular have become influential players in addressing issues like climate change uh, migration and the sustainable development. This trend highlights the increasing importance of non-state actors and decentralized governance structure in shaping um, global politics. So, my dear friends, thank you for listening. So, my dear friends, thank you for listening and thank you for joining me in this uh, almost uh, more than an hour 61 minutes and 28 seconds lecture this is your professor dr sana uh, thank you so much